Good morning, welcome to Whitburn Pentecostal Church. I am so glad that you're joining us online today. Again, everybody's online and uh, just we're just walking through these difficult times together. And so we keep, we keep doing that. We keep focusing on Jesus. We keep our eyes fixed on him. He's the author and perfecter of our faith. You know, all, all rests on him uh, today. Our, our faith, everything that we are as Christians rests on him and, and what he has accomplished for us today. And, you know, it's just incredible that we can come into his presence and to, and to worship him and really to focus on him today. And, and I'm so glad that you're, you're joining us. We're, we're sitting in our, our living rooms today um, and just being part of church. But I just pray today that we, we gather together um, in his name and you know that as we share fellowship with each other, albeit we're, we're separated geographically, we can be together in spirit. And so, Father, we just pray that you come and that you just fill us with your spirit, that you would anoint this time. Father, we pray that you would enable us to worship you through our, our gathering today, such as it is. And Father, just to experience your presence today. Father, we need your presence in our lives because, Father, it's your presence that changes us. It's your presence that sustains us. Father, it's your presence that leads us and guides us. And so, Father, we just confess again this morning that we need you we need you in our lives and so father we pray come and fill us and father as we worship you through song lord we just pray that you would just fill our hearts with praise and songs of thanks and worship and lord even maybe just now we raise our thanksgiving to you father just as we're gathered together in our living rooms uh, father we just say thank you to you this morning we say thank you thank you for your your blessings which you pour out father your blessings which are new every morning Lord, help us to always be thankful. And Lord, we just pray that you just be in our time together. We invite you into our time today to speak and to have your way amongst us. In Jesus' name, amen.
Father, we just thank you for the words of this song. And Lord, we pray that you would hear it as our worship to you today. But Father, we, we don't want it to just be a song. Father, we want it to be, to be a reality in our lives. Father, that sound that changes things, the sound of his people on their knees. And Father, we just pray that you would wake us up, Father. Lord, that we might understand the opportunity that we have as well as the responsibility that we have to really get on our knees for uh, those that are around us on their behalf. Father, on behalf of our nation, which needs prayer just now. Father, on behalf of our neighbors, which need prayer just now. And Father, just for your church, which needs prayer just now. Lord, we pray that you would help us to find that place. And Lord, may it be a place of joy where we get on our knees. And Father, where we begin to pray on behalf of other people. And Lord, we find the joy in coming before you in prayer. And Father, we just pray that you would presence yourself amongst us. Father, you say that where two or three are gathered in your name, then you're there. And, and Lord, we're here, we're gathered today in your name. And so, Father, we just pray that you'd come and that you'd presence yourself in every home and in every heart. Lord, whether we're watching this live or later on in the day or later in the week or, or maybe even listening to it on SoundCloud at some point, uh, Lord, af well after this uh, service has been has been uh, uh, recorded. Father, we just pray that you come and that you meet with us. Father, we need you. Lord, we need you. And we ask that you come into our experience today. Lord, that you'd be glorified in our lives. And so, Father, we just pray that you'd help us in these things. Lord, we, I just think of the words of Paul where he, he rejoiced in his weaknesses because, Father, he knew that it was in his weakness that you demonstrated your strength. And so, Father, we're just asking, even in our weakness, that you'd come and that you'd demonstrate your strength and your power. Father, we just pray for this church. Lord, we ask that your blessing would be poured out upon it. Lord, as we look to serve you and to serve your purposes, Lord, as we seek to know you more, Lord, we pray that you would just reveal yourself more and more to us. And Father, that you'd lead us in the path which you have set for us. Father, as individuals, as families, and as a church, Father, as we find our way uh, in, in the things that you're calling us to, Lord, we pray that we would just go with strength and with boldness into all the things that you call us to. Father, we just pray for every family. Lord, you know the needs that we have today. Every family's needs are different. But Father, we think of those uh, needs, and Lord, we ask that you just presence yourself in those needs. Lord, that you'd be to every single family what they need at this time. Father, whether it's emotional, physical, spiritual, financial, Father, those who, who need comfort, those who are grieving, Father, those who need healing, Lord, for those who need physical healing, Lord, we pray that even now you would pour out your Spirit, and Father, that you begin to heal people in Jesus' name and the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, for those who uh, just need emotional health today, Father, we pray that they would have a revelation of who you are today, and Father, we ask that they would just be lifted up from that place, Lord, that you'd set them on a rock. And Father, that you'd give them that sure foundation. And so, Lord, we pray, bless us as we continue in this service. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. Just one or two things uh, just to say. Um, you know, here we are, we're almost halfway through. Oops. We're almost halfway through uh, the, the worst months of the winter. And, uh, you know, we look forward to March the 20th, which will be the spring equinox. Not that far away. Um, where the, the, the length of daylight will be the same as the, the length of night time and then the clocks go uh, forward the following week and so we're, we're looking forward to, to better days coming in terms of the weather in terms of things brightening up and heating up but we're also looking to better days where you know this virus will be suppressed and where we will be able to come together and worship God again and so let's keep praying to that end. Let's keep hoping and believing. Let's keep serving. Let's keep supporting. And let's keep encouraging one another. Just because the days are short um, and there are things which are set against us all the time, it feels like. But let's keep our hope and our eyes fixed in Jesus. So we're going to just turn to God's word in just a little minute. So I want you to turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. We're going to read the first seven verses from there. And we're going to think about this topic, a celebration of busyness. The celebration of busyness is, is what we're going to think about today. And uh, all will become clear in just a little second. So uh, just the Lord bless you and, and uh, get your Bibles ready. 
Hi, let me just welcome you again, if you're just joining us, to Whitburn Pentecostal Church, to our service today. Um, just a couple of things that I just need to announce and just remind people that on a Monday morning at 9.30, we pray together on Zoom. If you want to join us, we can send you the link for that. Also, on a Wednesday night at 7.30, we gather together to pray again on Zoom, and we would love to have as many people there as possible. If you have access to the technology, please make time to be there and to join in with the church family to pray. Um, there are so many things that we need to pray for just now. And, uh, you know, I, I was just listening to the prayers um, as they were being prayed, as they were rising up to heaven last Wednesday night, and I, I just I found myself smiling. I was just so blessed to hear the prayers of uh, our brothers and sisters in Christ in the church here. And so can I encourage you to just be part of that? We'll meet together again this week. And uh, just to let you know as well that um, I will be working on uh, the, the Connection Point newsletter, and uh, that will be coming out just very soon, so just watch out for that coming in the post. Today's message, I, I kind of hinted at that, is called The Celebration of Busyness. I asked you to look up Revelation chapter 2. We're going to read verses uh, 1 uh, through to 7. And uh, why, why this topic and why today? Well, I think that the reason is that we can wear busyness like a badge. You know, it's like, it's like you know, you say to people, oh, how are things going? I've even done that this week. How are things going? Oh, really, really busy. You know, it's like, well, I know what that feels like to be so busy that you can become overwhelmed and you can uh, feel swamped by it. Um, and, and I know, I know, uh, because I have done this as well. People have said to me in the past, you know, I've, I've met up with people and they'll say, oh, how's church going? Oh, it's really busy, you know. How are you doing? Oh, I'm just so busy. And, and I know what it's like. I have been busy. But sometimes we can almost kind of like celebrate being over busy. And I, I just want us to pause today and think, is that what God really wants for us today? I'm going to just grab this book here. Give me, give me a second. This book is called Celebration of Discipline. It's by Richard Foster. And he goes into the details and opens up spiritual disciplines for us. And it's that word celebration of discipline, that expression, celebration of discipline. And, and I think we need to move from a celebration of the things in life that catch our attention, that keep us busy, that keep us focused, and, and perhaps keep us away from God, to thinking about celebrating the disciplines that will draw us closer to God. And that's where I want us to focus uh, over the next number of weeks, thinking about some of the principles that God has laid down for us as Christians, as followers of Jesus. And this message really has been on my heart for a while now. And uh, I, I kind of felt I need to share this before I go into uh, the, the message next week, which will be about Sabbath, a principle which we see right in the very beginning of the Bible in the book of Genesis, and one that carries all the way through the Bible. But I'm going to read from uh, Revelation, so if you've got your Bibles handy, if not, the words will be on the screen here as well. And this is the revelation uh, of Jesus Christ to a man called John. And he had to share these words with the church as well. And it says, To the angel of the church on Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks amongst the seven golden lampstands. Listen to this. What a fantastic church. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate w wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but were not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. <coughs> what a church. That church sounds familiar and it's a commendation to the church, but listen to what it goes on to say. Yet I hold this against you. This is Jesus speaking to this church. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Wow, what a thing to say to the church. Then he goes on to say, consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. I'll come back to open this up in just a little moment or two. 
If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. What an awesome passage of Scripture. And I want to draw our attention to this little part that we were focusing on in the middle. You have forsaken the love you had at first, a love for God. I don't know about you, but sometimes I I kind of think we can become a Christian and be so excited, and, you know, it's just like a love for God is, is immeasurable, it's, you know, unfathomable, and yet somehow as we get older in the Christian faith and in life, that love can tend to cool down a little bit as we get caught up in the things that God has for us. I want to just open that up and think about that for a little minute. The title, remember, is the celebration of busyness. That thing that we can go, you know, and I've done this, you know, I'm really busy and and, and we can feel good about being busy. And there is something good about being busy, but there's something potentially unhealthy about being overly busy. And that's what I want to focus on today. I've been thinking a lot about these things over the last 10 months uh, during lockdown. Um, where that all started to kick off in March, I I just found myself just so unbelievably busy in those first few months. Um, It was just, you know, it was painfully busy. And I really felt the Holy Spirit speaking into my soul and saying, you need to do something about this. This isn't right. And uh, I began to think about the way that I was living my life. Um, So, so busy and so, so under pressure. And And I really believe God has been speaking to me personally about this over the course of the last 10 months. And I heard about a title of a book. This is is the book in question. It's called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. I heard that title and I thought, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. One of the things that I absolutely hate is being rushed and being hurried going from one place to the next and, you know, sometimes you're in the car and you, you just want to go faster and you realize you can't. You know those moments when you're in the car and you're in a hurry to get to a meeting and it's that particular day that there's somebody really, really slow in front of you and all the traffic lights are at red and you're like, ah, I need to get there. I don't like that feeling of being rushed or being hurried. And so the title of this book really appealed to me. And so I've read this book. Um, I got it for 99 pence uh, on Apple Books. I think it's, you, you can get it on, uh, on Kindle for 4 99 these days if you're into that uh, or buy the, buy the hard copy. I, I really recommend people get a hold of this book and read it, you know, especially if you're a busy person, you've got a busy job, then I recommend that you take hold of this book. And in it, he references a study, and I went online to look for the information of this study. It's on a a website called Christianity 9 to 5. And this is what he says, the man who did this study, he says, from December 2001 to June 2007, I collated data from 20,009 Christians aged 15 to 88 across 139 countries using an online tool called the Obstacles to Growth Survey. And in that survey, there were two questions which I want to just draw attention to that I think were incredible. This is Christians from all walks of life, uh, from all sorts of nationalities, all sorts of countries, all sorts of ages. And one of the questions was, I rush from task to task. And 43% of the people who completed this survey said that they rushed from task to task often or always. 43% of Christians. And another question which was really interesting was, the busyness of my life gets in the way of developing my relationship with God, which is a measure of our distraction from God. 60% of these 20,009 people said that they are often or always so busy that they don't have time for God. Two-thirds of Christians, two in every three Christians, 
from 20,000, a sample across the world, across ages, across nationalities, said that they were often or always too busy to spend time with God. And the conclusion that the man who did the survey came to was that it seemed that Christians uh, worldwide are simply becoming too busy for God. Too busy for God. I don't know about you, does that challenge you today? As I reflect on the last 10 months, but beyond that, as I reflect back on my life, I find that quite a challenge because I am aware of my life and the times in my life where I have been too busy for God, even as a pastor. Wow, imagine, I can't believe I'm saying that. And so, in my times of reflection with God, I say, Lord, I'm sorry, I've been too busy for you sometimes, I recognize that, but now I'm doing something about it. You could say that this busyness and being too busy for God is actually a global issue, perhaps a global pandemic, and it's a problem for pastors as well. That study was done between 2001 and 2007. And if you read the book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, it will draw your attention to something which I have already shared uh, to some extent with our uh, leaders in the church in uh, the last two or three years. And that is that something happened in 2007 that changed the world dramatically, at least the Western uh, uh, sort of technical uh, if you have access to technology, it changed the world. And that was the introduction of the iPhone, the smartphone. And also with it, the rise in the use of social media and the effect that that has had. And I highly recommend that if you have access to Netflix, and if you don't, we'll make it available to you. We'll do a public screening of a documentary called The Social Dilemma, which talks about the problems that have arisen in society as a result of our distraction by social media. It's quite a powerful documentary, and I found it a really sobering documentary to watch. And someone, someone once said, if the devil can't destroy you, he'll distract you. If the devil can't destroy you, he'll distract you. And one of the biggest distractions these days for us is the technology that is around about us, that is there to be used for good, but it actually can become the biggest distraction out. Let me just tell you something, and it's a decision I came to before watching The, the Social Dilemma, actually. But since watching it, I have endeavored to go further. I have switched off everything, all the alerts on my phone that are non-essential have been switched off, okay? It's all been switched off, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in the Connection Point newsletter, which I'm going to send out via the post. Everything has been switched off unless it's to do with the phone or text messages. I have access to everything that I need in so many different ways, and I just feel that God has been speaking to me personally about these types of things. As a pastor, let me say this. To those of you who are part of this church, if working for God comes before worshiping God, then we have allowed the dog, the tail to wag the dog. If our work for God has come before our worship of God, then we're getting things the wrong way round. Worship God first, serve God second. And there are some key points in the message which I want to share with you today. Let's come back to it. This is a message from Jesus to the church at Ephesus at the time. And in this, we see the feedback sandwich, the good news, bad news, good news feedback. I don't know if you've ever been aware um, if you've maybe sat down for your appraisal with your boss and he says, oh, this is really good and this is really good, and then he'll say, but this bit, you know, that's, you need to work on that, and then he'll finish off by saying, or she'll finish off by saying, and that's really good and that's really good. It's that positive, negative, positive sandwich of feedback, and that's what Jesus does with the church here. He talks about, listen to the things that he talks about, the things that they're commended for. I know your deeds, your hard work, 
all the things that you're doing for God, and it's great. Your perseverance, you know, when we're tempted to fall back, step back, um, and, and take our foot off the accelerator, sometimes your perseverance, you're intolerant of wicked people. You test things. You expose things that are bad. You've persevered. You've even endured hardships. And I've talked about that recently in the life of the church, the, the need to endure hardships. And Jesus says these are all good things, but there's something that's missing. Something that you've missed out. You've left the love that you had at first. Listen to what it says in that verse. You've forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Stop to think about how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. Quite sobering thoughts, aren't they? To the church. And they need to do something about it. And if we're in that place where we are celebrating busyness and wearing busyness like a badge, then we need to stop and think, is God still first in my life? Is the worship of God still first in my life? Or have I replaced that with doing good things for God. And I would suggest that it's so easy to do that because in our serving God, we think that we're worshiping God, and in a sense we are, but that service for God can become a thing that replaces our worship of God. You know, it's like that in our relationships sometimes, isn't it? Sometimes we just want somebody to spend time with us and to talk to us and to listen to us and to just express their love for us. And you could say, well, I did this for you, and I did that for you, and I did the next thing for you. And you could say, well, that's really nice, but I just wanted you to sit and talk to me, to listen to me, to listen to what's on my heart. Jesus goes on to say and commends them in part three of the good news, bad news, good news sandwich he says that you hate the practice of the Nicolaitans. Nicholas was one of the seven deacons that we read about in Acts chapter 7, except he went rogue. He went and did his own thing. He had his own interpretation of things. This is what it says about the Nicolaitans. People who practiced this, they believed that all married women should be common to prevent jealousy. Wow. Wow all married women to be common amongst the other men in order to prevent jealousy. They were right to oppose that, my goodness. And Jesus says, I oppose that as well. But let's stop to consider these three things that they had to do. Consider how far you've fallen, repent and do the things you did at first. Consider to think about what's going on, about what you're doing, and God's essentially saying, you don't love me the way that you used to. Have you ever felt like that in a relationship, husband and wife? Have you ever felt that something's not quite right in your relationship and that your spouse doesn't love you the way that they used to? And you just want to sit down and spend time with them to talk and to listen and to share those intimate moments. But how can we think unless we stop. We need to slow down and almost come to a stop before we listen. That's what Sabbath is about. The word Sabbath, Shabbat in the Hebrew, means to stop. And once a week, we have as a church an opportunity to stop from all the things that occupy our life, to stop and to come before God and to worship God and to put Him first in our lives. <clears throat> a time to worship, a time to pause and to slow down and to reflect, and a time to take stock of our lives. We have the opportunity to do that Sunday by Sunday by Sunday. How can we stop, though, if we're too busy, running from task to task, rushing from here to there, with so many things in our diaries that we wonder how we're ever going to manage to get through them all? Too busy for God. How can we stop if we're too busy for God? How can we think about God if the busyness of life is getting in the way of developing that relationship with God? It's a challenge to us. 
Because I appreciate that life in lockdown is difficult because we have all sorts of additional pressures that we didn't have before that, especially mums and dads who are homeschooling and trying to do a job and trying to do all the things to keep your family safe and trying to keep yourself right and keep yourself safe and, and, and look after so many cares and things. I understand it's a difficult and pressurized time that we're living in with so many demands and so many things that want to get into our lives. But think about it. As a Christian, God still needs to be number one in our lives. Amidst all of those other things that occupy our time, God is still looking to be number one in our lives. You see, repentance is about recognizing that we're going in the wrong direction, about stopping, and about turning ourselves around and getting ourselves back on the right way. The only way we're going to do that as if we have the time to stop and think and hear the voice of God into our lives and do something about it. The problem is that the faster you're going in life, the harder it is to stop. The more momentum you have, the longer it's going to take you to slow down to a point where you can go, actually, I need to do something about life here. Do what you did at first Jesus said that to the church at Ephesus. Do what you did at first. Make the worship of God the number one thing. Have you ever observed young people who are in love and the way that their relationship works compared to maybe an older couple who've got kids and, and maybe the pressures of life and financial worries and, you know, Maybe there's the threat of job losses and all the stuff that goes on and you just feel this weight of pressure and it can, it can get in the way of your relationship whereas compared to the young couple who are just starting off and you just kind of see the, the stars in their eyes as they're looking at each other and holding hands and, and, and just kind of those long gazes and, and, and it's just like, ah, oh, it's just magic, isn't it? But, but that love... That love can change and does change. And I, I can testify to this, I haven't been married almost 30 years, that your love for your spouse changes as you get older. And life and the trials of life test that love and they test who you are as a couple. That love can still be expressed. But we need to think about how do we maintain that first love, the love that we had right at the start of our relationship. How do we maintain that? How do we feed that? How do we nurture that? How do we grow that? And it's the same with our relationship with God. I've been a Christian since I was six years old. I first made that decision. I prayed that prayer when I was six years old. And so I can't actually remember a time where God wasn't in my life and wasn't part of my life. But I have seen it in other people who have had a very different background from me and have come to know Jesus, and I've seen how that love for God has transformed their lives. But we need to be careful. We need to be careful as we go on in our relationship with God, as we get integrated into a church, as we get busy in the life of a church, that we don't put serving God before worshiping God. And as I said the other week, sometimes we need to live our way into a different way of thinking. Yeah, there's got to be some kind of thought there, some kind of intentionality there, but we've got to do it. And I've found, even in the last 10 months, it's about changing the way that I live that has changed the way that I think about things. And you know what I say, a mind stretched to a new idea can never return to its original shape. And this whole thing about taking time for God is so important, and I'll explore that more next week when we think about Sabbath. But if you look at the Ten Commandments, there are three commandments which, were, which are about putting God first, you know, about, about you know, honoring God and, and not having other gods like idols and taking time for Sabbath. Those three commands out of ten take up 70% of what's actually said about the Ten Commandments. And the commandment about Sabbath itself takes up 32% of the language that's used to explain these commandments to us. God is interested in us taking time for Him. God is interested in Sabbath, and we'll talk more about that, as I say, next week. But let's think about just a couple of references uh, to busyness as we draw things to a close. 
In Luke chapter 8, verse 14, we read the account uh, about the sower and the seed. And we think about four different types of soil that that seed lands on. There's the good soil, the rocky soil, the weedy soil, and then there's the stony path. I should have said that one at the start. The stony path, the rocky soil, the weedy soil, and the good soil. And that weedy soil, it says it's like this, like a seed that fell among thorns uh, stands for those who hear, uh, so, sorry, stands for those who hear, but as they go on uh, the way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. It's like so many Christians, they start off well, they love God with all their heart, but the pressures of life come in, and it chokes the life of God out of them. I referred to this recently, Martha and Mary, and Jesus is at the house, and, and there's Martha at Jesus, uh, sorry, Mary at Jesus' feet worshiping Jesus, and, and Martha's slaving in the kitchen, busy, 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 busy for Jesus. She was busy for Jesus. I'm not knocking. I'm not knocking her at all. And she comes through and she says, tell Mary to help me with the, you know, the preparations. And this is what Jesus said. I love, I love the way that he uses her name twice, Martha, Martha. You can almost hear Jesus trying to kind of just calm her down a bit. You're worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Busy, busy, busy with so many things and the necessary things. I understand what this is like, and I'm preaching to myself as well here, folks. But if busy, busy for Jesus replaces worship in Jesus, then we've chosen, we've chosen the wrong thing. We need to put God first. You see, if working for God comes before worshiping God, then we've allowed the tail to wag the dog. I understand about busyness. I understand about the busyness of life and work, and I'm aware that time is marching on here, so I'll try and pull things to a close. I remember a time when I worked in Mitsubishi, working eight o'clock in the morning till after seven at night, many nights, and just the busyness of life and the busyness of, of uh, crusaders when I worked there and, and the detrimental effect that that had on, uh, on, on Mary. Um, and I wasn't aware of it at the time. So, so busy, too busy. And I could go on for a long time telling you about working and ministering in church life as well. My life as a Christian in this church, especially in those days, those first 15 years in church where uh, I wasn't actually employed by the church as a pastor, but was working in so many different ways. There are so many things that I could say about that. And I, I, think, I think if I to go back to my young 20-something-year-old uh, self, I would probably say some things, knowing what I know now, to my young 20-year-old self, I would say maybe some things like this. Take quality time every day to listen to God, to read His Word, to develop your relationship with Him, and that includes prayer. I would probably say, let God heal the deep hurts in your heart. It will sort out a lot of the problems that lie on the surface of life. I would say be confident in who you are and pursue what God has laid on your heart with every ounce of energy that you have. If I had to go back to my 20-something-year-old self, I would say don't be intimidated by other people and certainly don't compare yourself to any other person. You are unique. Your perspective is unique and is valuable in the body of Christ. I would also say forgive quickly because the alternative is grief and a time and time unwisely spent. I would say work hard to understand the things of the Spirit that you may grow in uh, faithfulness, fruitfulness, and effectiveness. Work hard to understand how the Spirit works. Get to know the Spirit. Learn to be consistent in all the small, seemingly insignificant things. All the small things add up over time with consistency. Financial health, physical health, emotional health, relational health, spiritual health. These are some of the things I would go back and say to my young 20-something-year-old self. 
but I would be saying, make sure you spend time with God. Make sure you put him as number one in your life. Some of the young people today, the 20-something-year-olds, and maybe even younger than that, I wonder what you will go back and say to your younger self when you get to my age. I wonder if you will say, don't waste so much time with the trivialities like social media, smartphones, games, and entertainment. All can be distractions. I wonder if you would say to your younger self, don't sort of get stuck into God, develop a relationship with Him and with other people. Don't derive your sense of self-worth from the likes and the comments on social media. It's all so uh, flimsy a foundation to build your life on. Can I ask you, as we draw things to a close, what's taking priority in your life? Work or worship? Or is it even just simply your own pleasures, your own entertainment? I can guarantee that if you put God first, everything else will fall into place. When I moved out of my job in Mitsubishi, the verse that kept coming up in my daily devotionals was Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. It came up in devotionals. It came up in so many places. And what does it say? It says, seek first God's kingdom and His righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. A time of insecurity, a time of uncertainty, a time of stepping out in faith. I guarantee that guarantee that if you put God first in your life, if you make the worship of God the primary thing in your life, everything else will fall into place. Do you wear busyness like a badge of honor? Oh, I'm really busy. And that's not a bad thing. But if we're too busy for God, then we're too busy. Have we put the work of God before the worship of God? And don't think that means that you're getting off with working for God and serving God. God wants your work. God is looking for your service. He just wants you to love Him more. What's taking priority in your life? What are you giving your time to? And remember this when it comes to time. There's no such thing as time management, just self-management about thinking about what is important and urgent to us. And where does God fit into that picture? You can't save time. You can only spend time. And you can't create time. It just is. And for each of us, it's finite. And if any year has highlighted that to me, it was last year with the passing away of one of my friends who was the same age as me. Life is finite. And the last thing about time is that the quieter day will never come. I remember reading that in the 60-minute father written by Rob Parsons of Care for the Family when I think even bef before Sarah was born, I remember reading that. The quieter day will never come. We can sometimes be tempted to think that, oh, it's really busy just now, but the quieter day will come when things will settle down and I'll be able to do this and that and the next thing. The quieter day never comes. You can't save time, you can only spend it. You can't manage time, you can only manage yourself. Your choices, your priorities, the things that are important to you, that's all we have. And we have a finite amount of time to do it with to worship God and to fulfill His purpose for our life, we have a finite amount of time to do it in. And I would encourage us to grasp the moment, to grasp today, because that's the only time we're guaranteed is today, that we take that time to make God our priority, to make the worship of God our priority, and all the other things that we're looking for will fall into place. Make your relationship with Jesus a priority. He loves you with a passion. Jesus died for you on a cross that your sins might be forgiven, that you might be taken out 
of that place where you're stuck and set on a rock and given a firm foundation, which is Jesus himself, that he will change your life around, that he will begin to speak into the problems in your life, that he can begin to speak into the busyness of your life and turn things around. But we need to put God first because everything else flows from that. You know, maybe you've never made a decision to become a Christian. I pray that you experience that passionate first love that God wants to express to you and that you can express to Him. It's a prayer away. But if you become so busy that God is getting pushed out into the edges of your life, into the margins of your life, and maybe you can go through a whole day without even having thought about God or prayed to God or had any inclination of your relationship with God. You can go through whole days like that where you, you, you wake up in the morning and all the way through the day it's pressure, 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 pressure until you put your head in the pillow at night and you've not thought about God once. I believe God is challenging the church in these days to come back to the main thing and keeping the main thing the main thing, which is our worship of Him I believe God is doing a work in the church just now, which is resetting the church, which is reworking the church, which is remolding the church, which is shaping the church to be the church that He wants it to be going into the future. I urge you, I ask you to stop and take a moment to think, has the busyness overtaken my relationship with God? If so, let's please stop celebrating busyness. I'm not knocking being busy. I'm not knocking working hard. And there are many people who are working hard and doing so many great things. I'm not knocking that. All I'm saying is, let's not put that in front of our worship of God. We'll come to Sabbath next week and share some more things about the importance of this day in our calendar week by week. 52 Sabbaths every year. And I want to just focus on that just for a short time next week. But let's pray. Father, we just, we just pray that you would come into our experience, that you would speak to us. Lord, in those areas where we've maybe pushed you out to the margins, Father, we pray that we would push those things out to the margins and bring you back into the center of our lives. Father, we pray that we would make worshiping you the most important thing that we do in our day. Father, in our week, in our month, in our year. Father, we pray this as, as a church that you would just restore some things which have maybe been stolen away from us. Father, as a church that we would put Jesus first, that you would be our first love as a church. And Father, that we would worship you. Lord, we know there are so many things that we need to do in order to reach other people with the good news, and we will continue to do them. But Father, we pray that you would be at the center of it all, that you would be leading, that you would be guiding and Father, as the lead of this church, I confess that I am following your lead uh, today and in the days and months that will come. Father, uh, we want to just follow the voice of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so, Father, I just pray and I, I just ask and invite you in to speak into this church. Father, that you would give us direction. Father, that you would speak into this church. Father, that you would speak through uh, the prophetic words that you've already spoken through as we remember them and fresh words that you will give to us, Father, as we need to move into the future that you have for us. But Lord, in all of this, help us to keep you as the focus of everything that we do. In Jesus' name we ask. And if you've never made that decision to invite Jesus into your heart, I urge you, to do that today because tomorrow is not guaranteed. If you want to spend that eternity in heaven with him, then pray this prayer. Dear God, I have been so busy with my own life, following my own agenda, serving myself. Today, I surrender. I confess that I want to follow you that I've fallen short of your standard. I've done things that are wrong. And I put you at the front of my life, in the driving seat. And I ask that you come into my life through your Holy Spirit and help me to be the person you want me to be. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Amen. And uh, I hope that today has been a challenge to you. It's certainly been a challenge to me as I've reflected on these things over the months. And, and I, I really do pray that it's a challenge today to so many people. Put God first in your life. May you have such a blessed week as you go out into, you don't know what this week contains. I don't know what this week contains. But may we go out into this week knowing God's hand upon our lives, knowing that he is there, that he is there to bless you and to keep you and to give you the things that you need in your life this week. So the Lord bless you and have a great week. Amen.